Good morning, everyone. If you'd like to go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Thankful for everybody's presence this morning. If you're visiting with us, we want to tell you thank you for coming to be with us to worship God this morning. We hope that you can stick around so we can get to know you. This past week was VBS, and uh, we had the opportunity in the morning for Like I was saying, the parents have done a really good job of teaching the children between right and wrong, I believe. I believe that even if the kids themselves don't always do right, if it's hard for you to believe that when they're at home, they're talking back to you, they're not cleaning their room as they should, it may be hard to believe, but I believe that the parents have instilled in the children at least a desire to do good. And I think that's good for us to acknowledge that. Because as we talk about youth, And we are asking God to help us help the children, help those who are in adolescence growing up. I think it's good for us to identify who they are and what they're going through. A lot of times we think as youth as a carefree time. In other words, even in culture today, you have helicopter parents that try to take struggle and try to take uh, difficulties and challenge out of their children's lives. And they don't want them to hurt. They don't want them to struggle. And sometimes we think that's how kids live, that they should ought to live in a carefree time. Everything is bliss. Everything is dandy. However, we need to understand, just like all of us, James chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. So if you have children, and as I'm going to tell later on, even if you don't have children that are attending here right now, you need to be able to talk to them about these kinds of things. This is, after all, what we talked about in our VBS classes. We talked about temptation and peer pressure. We talked about being judgmental. We talked about sexuality. We talked about drinking and smoking, and we'll touch on some of those things today. So if it sounds familiar to the young people, it's probably because it's pretty familiar, and that's kind of what I talked about Monday and Tuesday. The kids are good. They're good listeners. A lot of times we think that they don't have an attention span that's worthwhile. You can't really have thoughtful discussion with them. Sometimes that might be true. Sometimes that's true of me. However, Monday night, you might be interested in knowing, I had them from 6 to 7. We talked for basically the whole hour back and forth about temptation, about peer pressure, and there was thoughtful discussion. They need to understand, and they need to understand that you understand that they are going through temptation, that they have struggles that they need to deal with, Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. We all need to understand that we are all on the same playing field of dealing with temptation and eventually sin. And the consequences of that sin, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because all of us have sinned, we are now separated from God. We all need to understand that we're all on the same playing field. Like I said, unfortunately, sometimes we want to act as if it's not as big of an issue for them, but it promises you that it is. And so we have this now thing that we need to think about, not only in our lives, but we need to think about in the children's lives as well, that we are all dealing with this. How can we help each other? How can we foster in this congregation 
a place where these kinds of things are ready to be talked about. I'm going to be honest with you. There were some things when I was growing up I didn't want to talk to my parents about. There were certain things that I felt uncomfortable bringing up to them. And that may be the case with your children with you or the children of this congregation with you, even though you may, there may not be a re- physical relation there, a blood relation. Sometimes it's uncomfortable to bring these kinds of things up. Let me show you kind of where we deviate here with uh, God's standard and how we fall into temptation and, and peer pressure. You have Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. A lot of you, without even going there, could probably quote it. It says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This is the golden standard. This is God's standard for marriage. So, Monday night, we talked about this, that this is his way that we ought to do things. There are so many, by the way, this morning, I've never probably been more nervous to preach a lesson like this in a long time. And it's most, most likely because I just don't want to say anything incorrect, and I don't want to butcher what I want to say. A lot of careful attention to what I've been thinking about. There's a lot of deviations to this in today's world, and there always has been. But for whatever reason, it seems like if, if you're older than me, if you're 30 or older, think back to the time you were growing up, and that is now nostalgic. That almost seems far away from this point in day. Children, and and I've heard it from y'all, that they are growing up with different kind of pressures, nothing new under the sun, but maybe just a different kind of pressure than maybe you did. It's more of a bombardment of this free sexual idea. We look at the standard that God put up for marriage, a man, a woman, them together, them coming together, and that's it. That's what marriage is. And in there, they find the sexual relation that they're allowed to have and nowhere else. So you, you have a couple of different deviations from this. If you look at that very first one, you look at course talk. I think this is kind of how it happens for a lot of young boys starting out. In my opinion, this is kind of what starts everything. They're now curious about those jokes that they hear in the locker room. They're now curious about those um, little things, insults maybe, words that they've never heard before. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, you're welcome to turn to these verses. It says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. This is a deviation of how God wanted us to talk about sexuality. Which, by the way, the Bible is abundant in talking about sexuality. A lot of you grew up in a... um, very hush-hush kind of way. Don't talk about these things. And I understand we don't want to be explicit, but the God's Word has revealed so much for us to indulge in, to read about, and so that way we don't have to go and find another source of news or another source where we gain this knowledge from. We find it directly from God. And so in a locker room, when a child is growing up, maybe a, a young man or whatever, and he starts hearing these jokes, and he starts hearing words that his mom and dad don't say, may, and, and things like that, it, it's almost like a first stepping stone. No sin is worse than the other, but it's almost like a first stepping stone in progression of where we're going to get to and what I'm about to talk about. And then later on, you get to lust. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, it says, But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, particularly, during VBS, I nag on the boys, but this is a problem just as much for girls, maybe just more prominent in boys, where you cannot control your thoughts, where if you are left to your own uh, mental and literally physical devices, you have a a really big problem holding back on this problem that is lust. And maybe you might be in public, you could be walking in the mall. You could be at Top Golf. You could be doing whatever, and you see someone who isn't wearing much clothing. Or maybe they are wearing much clothing, but you have such a hard problem with this that you begin undressing them with your mind. Because that's the way that the coarse jesting, the coarse talking, excuse me, if we can pull that back up. I don't know what I just did. Um, that, that's what it enabled you to do. You started getting curious, and now you started thinking about these things, and now you can't control your own lust. Well, that is a deviation from what God originally wanted. And then you continue going on, fornication and adultery. If you turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says, 
Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I sense in that verse, I'm not supposed to walk away from the pulpit, I sense in that verse a much, almost harsher judgment. Not saying that God necessarily uh, differentiates between sins, but it's almost as if this is something that we really need to watch out for. Not only just lust, but turning it into fornication, a physical act that involves somebody else. After all, that's what that verse says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. It talks about how we commit fornication. It's not only us, but we're involving somebody else. And somebody who decide maybe to go for the gold standard that is marriage, God instituted marriage, they decide that they love each other, they get married, and then the problems come. And issues arise within the family, maybe just between them two. And one of them begins to look for a boyfriend or girlfriend. And that is a deviation, a direct deviation from what God originally wanted. And then we press now further to a really big hot topic question at hand. And that is the question over homosexuality. In Romans chapter 1, if you turn your Bibles there, Romans 1 verse 26 and 27. It says... For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Do you see how all of these things are involved? Men with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. It, it, there's no question in my mind how God feels about the question of homosexuality. A lot of research, a lot of reading has been done to, like, why do people feel this inclination? I can tell you what the world says, some of the world at least. Just the way you were born, and that's okay. And our children are going to hear that for the rest of their lives, probably. I, it's not even saying that this, this idea is becoming more, it is accepted now. It may not be as prominent here in the South. You go anywhere other part of the country. You go to Europe. You go to more developed countries. It is accepted. This idea of homosexuality. There's no problem with it. And the issue is within, among Christians, the way I was raised, the people I hung around, the way that a lot of you were raised, if we're being honest, we look down on this particular sin with more judgment, with more hate than anything else. Sure, all of these things are deviations from what God instituted marriage. However, when we talk about homosexuality, it's like it's ten times worse. And if we come to it at a point where we are talking about it, we're belittling them, we're demeaning, we're being hateful, and we're joking about it, and there is a child in this auditorium, or they have friends at school that are dealing with this problem, well then of course the world is going to look more loving than we are. Of course the world is going to look more tender and more accepting. If you go to Matthew chapter 7, look at what it says in verse 1 through 5. Judge not that you not be judged. For whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First remove the plank that is in your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You know, if I am over here, and I'm watching the TV or something like that, because in almost all media nowadays... In almost all media nowadays, there is this idea of homosexuality. There is a person, a character that is in there. There's a couple or something like that. It's just widely accepted. If you recall, back when I was hurt, when I originally injured myself, um, my mom and my niece came to stay with me, and they took care of me. Well, on Netflix, she likes to watch this show called Chip and Potato. Probably never heard of it. That's okay. But it's this cartoon show about these dogs, and I was completely um, lost. I was completely oblivious. I was cool with it. I wasn't really watching it, and I'd be okay with her watching it. When my sister came to pick her up, she was like, why did you let her watch that? I was like, I don't know. It just goes. Well, it turns out in that 
cartoon for like, uh, how old's Emmy? Like three, for three and two year olds. There, there was a gay couple in there. There's, you know, it's about animals. There were two gay zebras. That's the way that they teach kids. And, and like I said earlier on, you know, we sometimes we want to like not talk about it because some of us, myself included, grew up in a hush hush society. A lot of us grew up in um, what one preacher called a Victorian era style of speaking about this where you don't want to speak about it at all I mean back in those days they would put lace doilies around the legs of a table just in case anybody thought okay well the table is showing too much leg that means I can a lot of you like that a lot of you like that it's pleasant and it's proper but unfortunately the Bible talks about it and we need to talk about it and we need to be okay with addressing these things with our children so in any sort of media, you'll find something like this being talked about. Well, we need to go further on with this, as it says in verse 3 and 4. If I'm walking around and I'm watching something like that, and I'm thinking to myself, look at those people, how weird they are, and I begin being hateful, and I begin becoming criti critical of that. And all the while, when my wife isn't around, when my parents aren't home, I can't control my lustful thoughts. I can't control my lustful actions. When I'm out in public, I don't have a stop on that. You're walking around with this huge plank coming out of your eye, and you're beating all these people down who have a speck, and you're thinking, I'm so much better than they are. I'm the Pharisee who's saying, thank God I'm not like them. I, I need to make sure that I've, I've got a good handle on this before I begin belittling other people. And you shouldn't belittle other people anyway. But in doing so, not only is it good for you, but I need to stress this, your children are being inundated with this, that it is accepted. And if you don't teach them otherwise, and if you, don't, if you aren't tender, if there isn't a component of compassion with how you speak about these things, they're going to think that the world is the better place. It is the better option. And by the way, we're not doing this to only compete with the world. We're not doing it just because it's a competition. This is the way it always should have been. But unfortunately, we, we somewhere went astray. We should have always been okay with this, with okay with speaking to homosexuals, speaking to somebody who has a problem with lust, with an adulterer, and saying, if you will only repent of your ways, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, do not be deceived, neither, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So he makes a very good point. The sexually immoral, the homosexuals, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's very clear. Continue reading on. And such were some of you. Those people we deserve the gospel all alike. Christ is at the door standing. It all depends on whether you let him in or not. That's the reason I asked Matt to lead that song. That invitation, the sweet tones are following, that's for everyone. And we need to be understanding of that. And we need to teach our children that. And we need to teach and talk to our kids about these topics. If we don't, somebody else will. So, this is, I don't even know if it's as much of a sermon, as much of a call to attention, um, but we can ask ourselves, what do we need to do? What does the congregation need to do to help? Let me go ahead and say this. I just used the word congregation, and I'm making a distinction between that and obviously a nuclear fa family. There are times where maybe a, a child, and this isn't a brag, I'm just being honest, a child has come up to me and has said something to me that they didn't want to tell their own parents, Okay. If that has ever happened to you, that's kind of a big deal. And in that conversation where you're trying to advise and, and sort of teach this child, there probably needs to be something said. You need to talk to your parents if you feel comfortable. You need to tell them this. You know, I, I say congregation, I want the family to be just as involved. And I think that's implied, but I just wanted to make that clear. What can I do? What can the congregation do to help? Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33. I want to make you aware of this. Ezekiel chapter 33. It says in verse 9, 
Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall surely die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. I'm just reemphasizing a point here that you need to have these conversations. It is a God-given commandment to have conversations with the sinner, no matter what it is. But especially, this may not be a sinner, but a, a, a teenager who has these doubts, has these insecurities, is questioning perhaps their own uh, preferences and sexuality. And if a parent or a, a loved one is unwilling to do something like that, they're going to find that information somewhere else. And in doing so, this is your God-given commandment to give instruction where you are wiser. And you say, look at God's word. It has already explained it for us. Let me show you better. There needs to be an environment in this congregation where we're okay with talking about these things with other folks. Look at what it says in James chapter 1. Turn your Bibles there. Or in James chapter 5, I'm sorry. Very ignored passage of the Bible. It says in James chapter 5, verse 15 and 16, and the prayer of faith will save one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up again. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, here is the admonition, confess your sins to one another, pray for one another, that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous man has great power as it is working. This, this is what it has to be, that there are people who are constantly asking and praying for one another. You know... Like I mentioned, the past four years, I've been teaching the Teenage VBS class. And to a lot of people um, in, in public, they kind of see me as a different kind of person. And I'm not bragging, I'm just being honest. Like Monday night, somebody brought a friend here. And they were explaining to me how they were explaining to somebody else who I was. And they called me the youth pastor. I'm no pastor. Anytime that's brought up, I try to explain that. That being said, I understand the confusion. That's how a lot of denominations do it. There's a young guy. I'm young. There's a lot of young children. Well, then it's just kind of common that you smash them together and you try to help each other out. That's kind of the idea there. However, it's not like I'm bearing some huge burden, but let's be honest, I, I don't need to be the only one. And, and I think you guys know that, and I'm not trying to brag, but I think you guys know that. There are other members in this congregation, like both the Lees, who try to help out and try to speak with these children, but there needs to be a connection with them, a deeper connection. Because if there's not, th who else will they turn to other than psychology, the world, what they see on TV, what they see on TikTok and on Instagram? That's what they're going to think is their best friend. If they don't have good, strong Christians there to advise them. And when we talk to them, just like I was talking about the idea of being judgmental, when we are dealing with our own sin, there has to be mercy and there has to be love look at what it says in first corinthians chapter 13 turn your bibles there please first corinthians 13 first corinthians chapter 13 it says starting in verse 4 Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, pay attention, is not provoked, thinks no evil. I tried to talk with the children about this on Tuesday, this idea of not thinking evil. This is the idea of you only see a portion of what one person is living and you take this evil suspicion. You go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. That's the word it uses. You only see a portion of their life. And you think to yourselves. And, and you rationalize with yourselves. And you do these mental gymnastics. Of all the things that is wrong with that person. So if somebody were to come up to you and say. Hey I've got this problem with this. I've got this problem with this. Can you please help me? The worst thing that you could do. Is begin blaming them for that issue. And saying this and this is why you're all wrong. This And being hateful. But love takes that person and tenderly tries to teach them in the right direction. I'm not being soft. Sin is sin. We've talked about that. But in the way that us who are advising need to deal with it, needs to be with mercy and needs to be with love. You don't need to think evil. There are a lot of um, articles and research that's been done on why people 
uh, have homosexual tendencies, right? And a lot of them, not all of them, uh, aside from the fact that they just kind of say, you know, this is accepted, when it starts out in their childhood or even infancy, perhaps there was a confusion, perhaps they did not have a good home life, not to be crude or, or to, you know, demoralize anyone, but perhaps there was um, uh, abuse or perhaps there was trauma. And a lot of times that stirs up a confusion in a child and they're wondering, you know, what, what it is that they need to do and how they need to act. And, it, it, and so we don't know a lot of times what's going on in people's lives. We, we don't need to look at them and, and, and think only evil. That's not what love does. And if you continue reading on, verse 7, love bears all things. And, and that's probably the best thing right there, that you're willing to help anyone out, even if, and like I mentioned earlier, I was raised a certain way, and I know a lot of you were raised a certain way. You bear and you endure those things, and you tell yourselves that's not the way things ought to be. And finally, if you turn your Bibles to first, or Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. It says in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Uh, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Did you catch how we're supposed to do it? There isn't supposed to be hate. There's supposed to be a gentleness. I am not the only 20-something-year-old in this congregation. I'm not the only 30-year-old. And I'm definitely not the one who has had the most life experience and the most wisdom to pass on to future generations. Okay? So, this morning, like I said, it's a call to attention more than anything. You need to be willing to have a relationship with our children and with their friends, so that way they're not seeking this knowledge anywhere else. After all, this entire congregation is, is battling is trying to do their best, best to live a Christ-like life in a community that is not Christ-like, in a nation that is not Christ-like, in a world that is not Christ-like. We're, we're all striving to get to the same place here. And if I need to lend a helping hand to a brother or sister or maybe someone who's not even there yet, then I need to be willing to do so even though that goes against my own rationalities. I began living for Christ and I don't listen to myself anymore. I need to have that kind of attitude and that we're all trying to get to the same place and to lend a helping hand. This morning, if the lesson has been helpful for you, I hope it has, and you need to make changes in your life, I hope that you do so. I want you, as we go into the next portion of the service and we begin to sing about uh, a land far away where the soul never dies, I want you to think about how there's less complications there. What I just talked about gave me a lot of nerves this week to talk about it. I would like to live in a place where there are not that many complications, where I'm with God, and that's what I need to worry about. It's what I need to worry about on this earth, so I want to look forward to it. Sing along as we stand, sing a song that's been praised.